Well, good morning, Foundry Church family. Wow, that was a long delay. Like, <laughs> let's try it again. Good morning, Foundry Church family. Love it. That's perfect. So my name's Eric. I'm the pastor out at Benjamin's Hope. Um, apparently, you have to be Eric to preach here. So there'll, there'll be another Eric actually next week as well, and it's not Eric Folkler, so there's, there's lots of Eric's back to back. Um, we'll talk a little bit more at the end of the service about my connection with the Foundry and kind of some things that are coming up next. You've already kind of heard a little bit about that this morning in the announcement time. Some of you may have been at the next event, um, kind of where we communicated a little bit a few weeks ago, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about how you can get involved and what's next. I'm going to actually weave that into this message today. But we're in this story of Joseph, right? Kind of this long narrative at the end of Genesis, and uh, we're in this section of the story that we're entitling Dreams, so these kind of dream interpretations that, that Joseph participates in. And um, let me just kind of highlight that we're in kind of the second part. It's sort of a two-part sermon. Um, Eric kind of talked about the first part last week um, where Pharaoh kind of says, I have this dream. I've checked in on kind of all the magicians and the sorcerers in the land and none of them can interpret it. And, uh, and then... There's this memory, right, from the cupbearer. Remember the cupbearer and the baker were in prison with Joseph, and, and he interprets both of their dreams. And in one of those dreams, it goes really well for the cupbearer. It doesn't go so good for the baker, right? So the baker is impaled by Pharaoh, and the cupbearer is kind of restored to his position. But two years pass, and Joseph asked the cupbearer, he said, would you remember me? When you're before Pharaoh, that's the one thing I ask. You just remember that I'm still down here and I'm trying to be faithful and kind of do my best in the position that I'm in. But if you just put a word in for me with the Pharaoh, and in two years pass, and this is what Eric preached a lot about that two years passing last week. Like, what does it look like for us to stay faithful in the wait? Right? And he kind of leaned into, hey, what? what is the waiting time in your life that you're in? Right? And, and this is sort of the second part of that message because remember, the cupbearer kind of remembers, he's like, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings, remember? It was like, oh man, I, there's this guy that interpreted my dreams, his name's Joseph. You might want to get him out of prison, Pharaoh, because he's going to probably be your guy to, to interpret your dream. And Joseph kind of has his moment before Pharaoh, right? His moment of kind of being able to shine. And Pharaoh's like, I heard you could interpret dreams. And Joseph's like, I really can't, but God can. And let me tell you, and, and I will interpret through God's power, I'll tell you what your dream means. And that's where we kind of pick up the story. So before we get into the, the word of God, would you just join me in prayer? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that it is for our life. God, thank you that even though these stories are thousands of years old, that your word just reminds us that, that this book and these words are living and active and they can kind of cut into our heart and our, our soul and, and divide even kind of down to our very spirit. And Lord, I pray that for that work of this word this morning. Lord, I lift up um, our friends who are on vacation, thinking of Eric and Erica this morning, for Justin and his family, Lord, who aren't here. Lord, give them rest and restoration. Restore them in their time away. And we just pray that you would join us here by your spirit. We trust that you do because you promise when we gather in your name, you're here with us. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to kind of pick up the story right there, right after Joseph says, I can't interpret your dream, but God can. Okay? So Genesis 41, 17 through 40, it's up on the screen. You can read along in the Bible that you have with you if you want. So then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, 
and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I had never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first, but even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. And then I woke up. And in my dream, I saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. And then seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. And I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It's one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only, res only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So we're entitling this message, Joseph Used by God. Kind of strange dreams, Joseph used by God. So what does it look like to be used by God? We're going to kind of focus our time this morning on how Joseph was used by God, but I think three distinct qualities of why Joseph was able and willing and ready to be used by God and how those things can kind of uh, also be a part of our life today. Because this story can kind of inform our life and our living today. So three things I think that, uh, that we can look at in this story. Joseph, because he was used by God and ready to be used by God, he was rooted in relationship. Can we say that together? Rooted in relationship. One more time. Rooted in relationship. The second thing is he was catalyzed through courage. Can we say that together? Catalyzed through courage. And finally, Joseph being used by God generates glory to God. Can we say that together? Generates glory to God. So we're going to think about those three things. What does it mean to be rooted in relationship, catalyzed through courage, and generating glory to God? Joseph, in his waiting, stayed rooted in relationship. And this is at the heart of what it means for us to be used by God. We need roots that go down deep into a relationship with God. So often when we're in a time of struggle or suffering or waiting or, or anxiety or worry in our life, we tend to look away from God 
and look to other things for our comfort or our happiness. But what God is oftentimes doing in those times of waiting or struggle, like Joseph's time in prison, right, is he's having those roots go down deep into him. Eric got into that a lot in his message last week. He talked about, you know, how did you use your time of waiting? What, what was happening during that time? Were your roots going down deep into your relationship with God? Or were you kind of looking to other things during that time? Right? Some of the other things that we've, we look to, right? The, the, the common ways that, that we kind of, the common things that we turn to in the wait, in the time of struggle, is we turn to things that numb us out, right? Because we don't want to feel that pain. We don't want to feel that struggle. So we use any of a number of things to just kind of numb us, right? And make us not feel those things. Sometimes it's substances, right? We might use some alcohol. We might, we might eat a little bit too much. We might binge watch Netflix or Hulu or something like that, right? We just want to kind of check out and not really feel that thing that's happening to us and not really kind of have our roots go down deep into, into, into our relationship with God. We might distract ourselves, right? Just get involved in something else that's just kind of distracting. We might avoid whatever that thing is. But what God wants to do in that time of waiting, and what we see in Joseph's life, is this kind of rooting in relationship. The, the way that we see that is after that two years of waiting, right, when, when Joseph is brought out of prison into Pharaoh's presence, and Pharaoh says, hey, I heard you can interpret dreams, Joseph's so rooted in relationship with God that the first thing he does is points to God. He doesn't point to himself in any way. He says, you know what, I can't even do that, but I have a God that can. I have a relationship with a father and a God that can do those things. And we see that rooting in relationship. I love the way that it, it, the psalmist kind of puts this in Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and his leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. This picture of the roots of the righteous person going down deep into relationship with God and drawing from that living water so that there's life, there's prospering and flowering of that tree and fruitfulness in that life, right? Right? And this is the key to each one of us. If we want to be used by God, if we want to be a tool in his hand, that begins with being rooted in relationship. Jesus kind of said it this way in John 15. He said, if you're not connected with me, if you're not connected with the vine, there is no life in you. That's where all the life comes from. Connection with, with Christ is where life comes. That's where fruitfulness comes. Apart from that, we've got nothing. We see that in Joseph. He's, he stays rooted in relationship. This church, the foundry, has a number of ways that you can do that. And I want to just kind of highlight a few of those in the life of this church. So one of the ways we, we stay rooted in relationship is when we gather together with God's people, right? On Sunday mornings or on Monday nights, this church, this family of God gathers and worships and gives glory to God, hears the word of the Lord preached and expounded upon. But that's often not enough, right? Because the, the, the week is long in between Sundays, right? So this church also provides devotionals for you to use to prepare your hearts and be ready for the word of God on Sundays and Mondays. And then this church also has small groups where you can gather together with one another and kind of talk about the sermon and go deeper together, right? So I want to encourage you, if you have been attending here, even if you're new here, the way that this church works is Sunday mornings and the devotional guides and the small groups are all meant together to keep you rooted in relationship. I want to encourage you to get involved in those things. The way you can do that, you can use this little card right here and you can check on there. I'm 
I want to get involved in a group. And you can just check it on there. The devotions are available at the exits. There's paper copies there, or you can find them online, too, at the website. And that's how you can kind of stay deeply rooted in relationship. I want to talk about a story from the Foundry Church from its very beginnings. That's a story to me about this church staying rooted in relationship. I've been connected with Eric for a long time. We've been friends. Um, I was kind of a, a ministry mentor to him early on, way back when he first moved to Michigan from Mercy Ships. And so I've kind of followed Eric's story. I've been kind of connected with the work of this church in a number of ways. I wasn't very connected at the time of this story, but I remember Eric telling it to me, and I have his permi permission to share this story with you. And I think it, it, it points out how this church in its very kind of foundations, is rooted in relationship. Um, I remember Eric telling me the story. The, the church had been gathering for a number of months and you know, had a, kind of an initial swell of people and then it kind of started losing some people. And there wasn't a lot of people that were gathering at this church initially. This was the, the kind of late summer, early fall of 2014. So about four years ago now, Right? And I look out here and there's, you know, 400 of you here and there was 400 more of you here at the first service and there's another two or 300 that come on Monday nights now, right? But at that time, there was about 30 people that were gathering together in the gym over at Vriesland on Saturday nights. And some of you may be part of that 30 people, right? And but some weeks it was 30, and then some weeks it was maybe 28. Maybe the next week it was like 25. And there was this, this thought of like, God, are, what are you doing here? Are, are we rooted in you? Let's stay rooted in you. And I remember Eric sharing with me that he and Erica and, and his family kind of sat on the steps of the foundry, and Erica praying very distinctly, Lord, I pray tonight that you would bring 50 people that 50 people would be gathering with us tonight. And, and Lord, we, we just want to, we, we believe you're calling us to this. We believe that this is your call in our life to start this church and to grow this church. And look, just show us your glory. Show us that you're here. Show us that we're on the right track. And that night, 54 people came. And the week before, there was 35, right? That's like 40% more people. I don't know if my math is not great, but it's a lot more, right? And and I love that story because to me it shows that the DNA of this church from way back is all about being rooted in relationship. It's being open-handed and saying, Lord, what would you have us do? We're in this for you. We're following you. Our relationship with you is at the core and the heart of all that we're doing. And in, in the story of, of Joseph interpreting this dream, we see that rootedness in relationship. So being used by God starts there, that rootedness in relationship. But it's also that being used by God is catalyzed through courage. Catalyzed through courage. Anybody remember that word, um, catalyst, from high school chemistry? Anybody remember that one? A few of you? Some of you want to forget high school chemistry, I understand. I, I really did a, a lot of work to, to block that out of my brain too. But a catalyst is something that you add to a couple of chemicals to like make the chemical reaction happen, right? And courage is so often the thing that we add to what God's already doing. God's at work all the time through his spirit, kind of advancing his kingdom and growing his church. But he wants us to be a part of it. And our courage to step into the work, and to be part of it, is oftentimes what catalyzes that work. It, it makes it come and advance, right? Because God wants to use people. He doesn't have to, but he wants to. And so we see that in this story too with Joseph. This movement of God is catalyzed through his courage. He's rooted in relationship. In that time of waiting, he stays rooted in his connection with God. But then he's got enough courage when the time comes and he's before Pharaoh to tell him the truth and to speak what God gives him and to speak the truth in love before Pharaoh. Because you can imagine that interpreting that dream, even if God gave him the interpretation, that's kind of a scary thing to say to Pharaoh, right? The, 
At this point, this is probably the most powerful human being on the planet, right? And Joseph is before him. In the first part of the dream's pretty good, right? You're going to have seven awesome years. This is going to be amazing, right? We're going to have the most crops that we've ever had. To put it in modern day language, the stock market is going to be uh, up and to the right for the next seven years. It's going to be amazing. But there's a reason that that's going to happen because after that, the bottom's going to fall out, right? And Joseph's got the courage to say to Pharaoh, you've got years of abundance coming, but following that, it's going to get so bad that nobody's even going to remember that those years of abundance happened because it's going to be so bad they're going to even forget that it happened. And then he says, there is a strategy for you, Pharaoh, in this. Hear this truth. During those years of abundance, you should take 20% of all the crops and you should set them aside and save them up for those years of famine that are coming because you're going to need it because otherwise you're going to die. Right? And all your people are going to die if you don't follow this way. There's courage for Joseph to step into that and, and to say hard things to Pharaoh. Being used by God means being rooted in relationship and having that relationship with God fed through your time in the Word and the Holy Spirit in your life and time in prayer and being faithful to hear what he has for you. But it also means when God gives you a word and he says, I need you to step out now. I need you to tell the truth. I need you to, to, to have this conversation or to do this thing. It's catalyzed through our courage and our faith to say, okay, God, I'm, I'm all in. I'm a tool in your hand, right? I don't know what that looks like for you, what, what God's calling you to be courageous in, but maybe it's a hard conversation that you need to have. Maybe it's somebody near you, right? A, a child or a spouse where you've got to sit down and and, and say a hard thing. Say, you know what, I, I see you wandering away from the Lord. I, I, my heart hurts for you. I, I, I pray that God would bring you back. Maybe it's a hard conversation that you have to have with a coworker, or maybe God's calling you to, to talk to a friend or neighbor because you don't know where they're at spiritually and, 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 and what their life will be like eternally. I don't know what that looks like for you, but God is constantly and consistently calling his people that are rooted in relationship with him to be courageous and to do something courageous in his name, right? We see that through Joseph, his, his ability to, to say hard things to Pharaoh and to kind of do that. We're going to talk a little bit in just a few minutes about Foundry next and what might it look like for you to be courageous in that next call of this gathered people, Right? So finally, we find that being used by God generates glory to God. It generates glory to God. And then in small parentheses after that, and a blessing for you. You can advance the slide to the next one. So glory to God is the big, the big outcome of our faithfulness and our rootedness in God and our courageousness to follow him. But there is blessing for us in that as well. But I want to make sure that you know that that's in parentheses and underneath God's glory. And we see that in this story, right? Pharaoh, I love it. Pharaoh, not part of God's chosen people, but somebody that through the course of, of Joseph's courageousness and his pointing to God, Pharaoh begins to point to God and give glory to God. He says this, so Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, Joseph, one in whom is the spirit of God? Joseph is, or, or Pharaoh is bearing witness to God's goodness and seeing God in Joseph. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace all my people are, sub are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. God receives glory when we're rooted in him and we stay rooted in him, when we listen for him, when we're courageous to step out and do what he's calling us to do. And God is glorified, right? Even, even wicked people like Pharaoh begin to, to sit up and take notes and say, you know, there's something different 
about this person and the God that they serve. This person, Joseph, has the spirit of God within him and and God has made this known to you, right? God is glorified and we'll see as the story moves on. This, this dream and this dream interpretation and what happens out of it, what Joseph ends up doing and, and the whole campaign that he runs of basically storing up all these, all these crops for, for, the, for years and then kind of distributing them for those years of famine, basically save the known world from destruction and definitely save God's people. The remnant of God's people are saved through, through this, this work, this courageous work of Joseph, this rootedness in his relationship with God, his courageousness to step out brings honor and glory to God and, and ultimately blessing for Joseph as well, right? He's placed in a position of honor and authority and power but not because of what he did, what God did through him, right? And this is the story for us as God's people. We get to be a part of doing amazing things in God's name. We get to be a part of seeing kingdom advance and bearing fruit for his honor and glory. This church in four years has gone from 35 people in a gym to well over a thousand worshiping and and gathering and bringing glory and honor to God. And there's many, many more people in West Michigan that have yet to come into God's family through faith in Christ. There's many who don't know him. There's many who we have a heart to reach in and around West Michigan. And that's why we're thinking about Foundry next. What's next? What do we do? How are we going to do that? Right? And as you think about your rootedness in relationship and your courageousness to step out and how that's going to be, bring glory to God. I, I pray that you will, you'll think about what's next for you as it relates to this church. If you haven't gotten one of these cards yet, they're available on your way out. And what I think is so beautiful about this card is it's kind of a blank slate, you know? A lot of response cards have a lot of data on them. They're saying, check this box if you want to do this or that. This is like, hey, what is the Lord calling me to do? Which means it has to be rooted in your relationship with God. It has to come out of your time of prayer with God. Your time with him of saying, Lord, what would you have me do next in the life of the Foundry Church? There's a few ways that things are unfolding, right? Right? There's, there's that kind of new piece of land and property over on Chicago Drive and a, a new live worship site that will be larger than this one, which is part of the vision. There's a prayer team that's gathering, and, and I love that because that prayer team is all about staying rooted in our relationship with God and making sure that everything that we do comes up out of that. But I'm probably most excited, just because of my role, of being the first satellite location of the foundry is going to happen out at Benjamin's Hope, which is amazing. Some of you may have come into the life of the foundry a couple of summers ago when this, this place was being renovated, right? And, and we worshiped together at Benjamin's Hope. I have the great privilege and honor of being the first campus pastor of the foundry church out at Benjamin's Hope, and, and we're working towards sometime mid, mid-fall to be kind of launching that first multi-site. The way that'll look is I'll be the live host and pastor there, right? And then the teaching will happen through a video screen, through Eric and or whoever's, whoever's teaching at the live worship site, and you will see video teaching, but it'll be live worship and live hosting and ha- have a live pastor, which will be me. And we're hoping and praying that 150, 200 people from this body will say, you know what, I feel like what God is calling me to next is to take a step out in faith and be a part of that that launch. And I'm asking if you would pray about that. I'm asking if you would pray, just specifically, just pray that prayer, God, what's next for me? What's next for us? What's next for our family? 
being rooted in relationship, catalyzed by courage, all for the glory of God. And, and I'm sure we'll look back years from now and we'll think of, of this as a moment in time where we said, you know, remember when we were only 1,000 people? Now we're 5,000 or 10,000 or whatever that looks like, however many sites it looks like, right? The Lord has been faithful to grow us from 35 to 1,000 in a couple years. What does he have planned for us next? I don't know, but I know that I want to be a part of it. I want to be up close to it. I'm so thankful to be called by God to this place at this time. And I want to do it with you all, right? So pray about that. Pray about what's next for you. And bring this back on August 22 saying, you know what? I know what God's calling me to. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for Joseph. We thank you for the picture that he is for us of of staying rooted in his relationship with you, even through hard times and waiting and struggle. Lord, we thank you that he stayed close to you and faithful. And Lord, that his heart was to bring you honor and glory. We thank you for his courage, Lord, that, that he was willing and able to come before Pharaoh and say courageous things and hard things and say, you know what, there's going to be some good years, but there's going to be some, some lean years that follow, and you've got to prepare for that. Or thank you for his willingness to speak hard things and to speak truth into that relationship. And Lord, more than anything, we thank you that you are receiving the glory or that you receive the glory in that story and that that story continued and it, it brought about salvation and redemption for your people and the world. And Lord, we are thinking about what does that mean for us? Where do we need to stay rooted in you, God? Where are you calling us to be courageous? What are you calling us to do that could bring you glory, Father? We love you so much, and we thank you for the opportunity to be a part of what's next here at the Foundry Church. We trust that you'll show us, give us courage to follow. We pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that love. If, you know, we talked about being rooted in relationship this morning. Maybe you don't have a relationship with God yet. Maybe you, you know, sing about that or hear about that unre unrelenting, reckless love of God. And you're like, I, I just have questions about that. I would love to talk to you about that. The Lord is constantly drawing people to himself. And maybe that's you this morning. And if you know that love, who's, who's God calling you to extend that love to? And he loves all people that way. He loves your neighbors that way and your coworkers that way and the people down the street that way. His love is unrelenting for the world. He wants to use you to be a part of his, his glory. Think about who you can be courageous for this week. And the power that comes from that comes from him. So hear this blessing. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. There is a light.